Hello, this is Armin of SG Gaming Info, and welcome to my video review of Tales of Zestiria. Now, Tales of Zestiria is a game that tries to offer a lot for both newcomers and veterans of the Tales of series, but at times, the game tries too hard and becomes frustrating to play. The game has a lot of charm, especially when it comes to the playable characters and how they interact with the world and each other. However, the game's combat and story did tend to waver for me, especially after playing it for long stints of time. What I'm going to do the rest of you is now, I'm going to break it down to sections so you get to have a better understanding of my opinion each part of the game. The characters in Tales of Zeria is by far the game's strongest point. Your companions and the characters you interact with in the world help bring the world to life. From the resident of a play kid village, to knights that feel they are trapped in the middle of a power struggle for a kingdom. The impression card interaction creates makes me feel invested in what I'm doing, and honestly, this game is one of the few occasions where I actually feel for the various characters I meet in my travels. And that feeling isn't limited to the good as I found myself in sympathy towards some of the game's villains. I get the same feeling when it comes to the main character's companions, although it is stronger as each companion is more fleshed out. Each companion has their own quirks and personalities, and you get to see how the quirks and personalities either do or do not work with other companions. The best example of this is between Edna and Mikleo. Edna is the Sheriff of Earth, with a Seraph being a spirit-like creature, and Mikleo is the Seraph of Water. And as you play through the game, you get to see how they both interact with each other via cutscenes and skits. Now these skits are optional, fully voiced conversations that help give you backstory and characters. And through those you see how both these characters like to fight and hit off each other. Edna is the type of character that likes to kind of create forced animosity for a laugh. When she's interacting with Mikleo she said she'd make fun of the name Mikleo, so Mikleo and all that. And just throw him into situations like going, oh what do you think about this Mikleo? Without him realising and being put on the spot, she gets a laugh out of that. And it's good to see. You also see with other characters, for example, Rose, who is a human, and Lila, who is the Sheriff of Fire. Now, if you're like me and enjoy a lovely pun, these two characters are the best for it. Best example is, they're supposed to go through an area and there's a boulder blocking it. They were told there's a boulder blocking it, and I believe Rose says, well, we should have taken a bolder approach. And it's just lines like that, and going, I hate it, but... I just love the delivery of it. It makes the characters feel more alive. And it's also interesting with Rose and Sarai, who's the main character. They're both human, and the other companions are seraphs, so they cannot be seen by anyone else apart from themselves, or maybe the one or two people that have the ability to see seraphs. So it's very interesting because when there's character conversations, you get to see the perspective between Sarai and Rose, who can see the seraph, and the perspective of people around who can't see them. So it makes some excellent character developments, especially because Sora is not prone to lying, so you might get an occasion where Edna might poke Sora with her umbrella to not say certain things. In fact, actually there's one point in the game where Edna goes up and actually pokes a knight when they're having a conversation of being the shepherd. It's like, oh, I've angered this the seraphim, I'm so sorry. It's really interesting dynamics like that that make me fall in love with the characters and the world. I would say very few games would actually do that for me. Okay, I like the characters, I begin to get attached to them. But in Tales of Zestiria, I get so attached to them more than I have in any game. Because you get to see them, you get to talk with them, you interact with them. Like, Tales of Zestiria is a pretty long game. So you get to know them, you get to kind of teach them like family. Because at the start, Mikleo and Sora know each other for a long time. So you don't see much as much having to know between how Sora interacts with Mikleo. But as you go through the game, you have to see how they interact with all the rest, like Dezel, who's Seraph of Wind. He's kind of standoffish, so Sora kind of has to work tougher to interact with him. Edna, who seems very cold-hearted, but is actually kind of not. Rose, who's very mysterious. How he, how she interacts with Sora and how he interacts with, with her. Then you have Alicia, who's a princess and a knight how they interact all together and it's well done and I personally enjoy the conversations I have together and it helps bring me into the world like nothing else does in the game. Even enough from characters let's talk about the game's story. 
Now the game's story focuses on Sore, a young adult who spent his entire life in seclusion with Seraphim, also known as Seraphs. And he's basically one of the few humans in the world that can actually see Seraphim, which is makes him an ideal char character to become a shepherd, who is basically in the game's lore, the man who can basically save the world from malevolence, which is this kind of creation of darkness that is in like the hearts of man and everything. Now before he reaches this point, he actually comes across a female knight called Alicia, who he rescues while going through some rooms with Miklio. And Alicia puts in his head the fact that, oh, maybe he should come down to, to the human world and basically decide to become a shepherd because he seems strong enough. And so from the story, the story is basically from him accepting the role of the shepherd and taking on some seraphim and trying to go out to save the world. It is a very simplistic story. You never see Sore refuse the journey outright. He does have some moments where he's not too sure if he should, should be the shepherd, especially when Miklio is involved. At the start, he doesn't really think Miklio, who is his friend, he's a seraph, he doesn't think he should be involved with the word the shepherd because the world of the shepherd is a dangerous place. Like, that's kind of good character progression as well. But when it comes to the story, it's weird. The game takes, the story takes a long time to get going. I got 24 hours into the game before I stopped to write, to write this review. And at the start it's like, okay, the bet Lila, who is kind of the lord of the shepherd, which basically, she's helped, makes, basically makes Sorry the shepherd. She says the way to get rid of the malevolence is to install lords of the lands in various areas. So you're basically brought to the idea, it's like, okay, the basically the idea of the game is basically find seraphs and uh, find things for them to go into for people to worship. Which again is kind of interesting in my mind, is that you kind of have to kind of create false religions in a way. I remember this is a kind of a slight spoiler from the start of the game. The first Lord of the Land you get is basically his kind of housing location is in a chalice, in a church. And the chalice full of pure water and basically people now worship the chalice and the water inside it to empower the seraph which struck me as kind of odd and very weird back to the story like you're told this is the thing to do so you go to villages and towns trying to purge the malevolence and install lords of the lands but then you're told oh maybe you shouldn't be focusing on this maybe you should focus on getting into cause of malevolence which is the lord of calamity and it's a good few hours in, I say about eight, nine hours of in, in game time, you finally meet Lord of Calamity for the first time. And it's a big fight and you lose. And at the same time, they add another plot in where two of the main factions of the world, the Kingdom of Highland and the Rollins Empire, are trying to go toward each other. So you have to find out what happened with the Rollins Empire, what's happened to Highland Kingdom, and there's a lot of stuff being thrown around. And a lot of times you forget that your actual mission is basically to cure the world of malevolence. Yes, some of the jumped around does cross over with the actual story. But it's all sort of jumping around, it's like, oh, my mission is this. Like, no, your mission is this. No, your mission is this. The like, mission keeps jumping around a lot and it kind of disturbs the coherence of it. This is especially fact when you're 20 hours in, is told, I have to complete Shepherd Trials. So you run around completing the Shepherd Trials and it's like, oh, I have the Shepherd Trials done. I'm now ready to take on Lord Calamity. No, wait, you actually have to go do this thing that. I don't know, you would think it's a side activity, but no, it's a part of the main plot. It did annoy me a lot with the story, and did put me off. You wanted, to, I wanted to be dragged into it, but I couldn't. It just dragged on far too long for my taste. I think if the story was more coherent and shorter, it would be better. But at the way it is, it's kind of disjointed, not fun at all. And actually, speaking away from mention the Lord of the Lands. They're actually just a part of the story, but relegated to a side story. And speaking of side stories, this game doesn't have side quests. In the traditional sense, they have kind of side missions that you can st stumble upon. And that's both good and bad. It's like, oh, I don't have to go around doing side quests. I have the option of doing them, but at the same regard, it means that leveling up is tougher and becomes more monotonous because leveling is based around now just killing monsters in the wild and Really, that only becomes so much fun for so long. Now let's talk about the game's combat. On the surface, Tales of Mysterious Combat is your common, action-fast paced combat system with, with a brand new system that involves characters fusing together to power up. But just like the story, its charm is eroded over time, especially when you're just inundated 
with enemy upon enemy encounters and this is also highlighted by the fact that the only real way to level in the game outside of the story is in combat so if you want to level up higher you will have to go to fight after fight after fight and in the end well it is fast and action paced there's a dodge system you're actively hitting it gets tedious because you find yourself just mashing the, the circle attack button and maybe trolling the occasional guard or dodge just to feel like you're doing something. However, when you get to boss battles, the combat completely changes. It's like a brand new organism. You, it's, a, it, it's one versus four, so you, you know there's a target you're aiming at. You don't always have to be looking, after, looking over your shoulder expecting, oh, is another enemy going to attack me? So you can focus on one target, you can focus on doing expert dodges, which is brilliant because when you dodge a combo attack on an expertly, you feel like you're rewarded. You feel like you did something memorably as you dodge out of the way and hit them with your own combo attack. Now boss battles and encounters as well have the issue that the four characters in your team and you're only controlling one. The three AI controlled characters have their issues, especially with Rose, who, like Sore, the main character, confuse with the four seraphs on your team. And while you can choose to combine and then uncombine at will, you really don't want to uncombine because it's detrimental in using power and it's another panion for an enemy to kill. And God knows your companions will die a lot. So, what Rose does, and it's kind of annoying, is she does fuse sometimes, but after a certain amount of time, she's like, oh, I'm gonna unfuse. And that's highly annoying. I would love if that was changed. And especially the control over the AI is like they're kind of doing on themselves. You have limited control. It's like, oh, I want you to be defensive. I want to go all I want you to go all attack. I want you to spread out. Now, there's very little need to actually use these commands. The only time I really used it were in boss battles, where I eventually find out, oh I'll just put my my AI characters on defense so the boss doesn't go near them and I'll just wail on the boss well all the rest are still alive so I don't have to waste my life bottles to restore them to life. So it is a mix back in the lot during fighting wave after wave encounter is tedious over time. Boss battles then alleviate that tediousness as they add an extra level of difficulty. But even I would say even having encounter battles difficult as leveling progression is very slow in the game and the monsters you encounter level quicker because I've found myself level 30 fighting creatures that are between 8 and 10 levels higher than me. But I said like there is a difference with when you're going through the counters and when you're going to boss battles, it does waver. Is there any other issues that I can see in the combat? Well, there is the camera for one. The camera likes to mess around a lot, I find. When you're at the edge of a combat field, the camera zooms straight in. So basically, the reason because that is because it seems like the feel itself acts like an object so the camera gets pushed in which makes it very difficult to see especially against numerous opponents because they could be you couldn't you can't see your rating so you might you might get killed and that has happened to me many occasions where I would get I would not know where my character was and I got killed. This happened once in a boss fight I remember when there was trees dotted around the battlefield and the camera would decide hey let's focus on this tree. Now you do have I suppose some degree with the camera changing where you can pause game and then have it zoom in or pan to le left or right more. That does offer some help but not a huge lot because you're still left at the mercy of the camera when you're not having the game pause because you can't independently turn it. And then finally there are some of the arts moves where are kind of like magic attacks in the game. Particularly mystic arts which are activated by having your battle gauge over 4 and you're pressing the R2 and circle button at the same time when doing a combo. Now I've tried this many times and when a time to do it, I can never get it to work, but when I don't want to do it, it works. It's a weird system that's like, oh, I'm pressing these buttons, why aren't these working? At one point in the game I was facing a boss where I had to use Mystic Arts to win. Well, I didn't have to, but I felt like it would help me a lot. I could not activate it at all. It was incredibly frustrating until I was like, Oh, I don't want to use it anymore, and then I ask the baits. It was highly annoying, and I don't know if that's the fact that I'm not doing the controls correctly. Even though in my mind I am, I'm not 100% sure. 
I think I think I've talked about enough about combat. Let's look at the other parts of gameplay of Tales of Zestiria. There's more to Tales of Zestiria in the gameplay format than just the combat. Just like in most JRPGs, there are a lot of outside combat elements to the world, mostly revolve around exploration and gathering, and this is no different in Tales of Zestiria. Now, I just before I talk about the exploring the world, I actually want to focus on the item shops in which you can buy new weapons, armor, fuse items, healing items, etc. Now these shops are dotted throughout the world, a lot of them are found in towns, cities and villages. And it has a very big issue for me personally, and that is when you go to buy a weapon or piece of armor and you, you go over it, it's highlighted and you look down the bottom and it tells you if it's good or bad for your for each character. It's, so it's good, it's a green green arrow pointing up, bad, red arrow pointing down. If it makes no difference, it's a orange equal sign. But this green arrow, red arrow equal sign doesn't give a lot of information. Like, it's like, oh, it's better. But if I buy it and I look into equipping it, it's like, no, it doesn't offer me increase in this stat that I'm interested in. It's a very vague approach. Now there is also the system in the item shop where you go try on goods where it offers a much more in-depth approach. So if you go to buy a weapon or armor via try on goods, it shows a more in-depth stat. So say if I'm buying a sword for Saray, it would say on the bottom if it increased my attack, my arts attack. So say if it increased my attack, it's like say if my attack is like 250 and it increased, it would say on right beside it, if it, but the, it could be say 300 so it's a Forty increase. That's how you know better. Now I know what your thing is like, but that's not really an issue. My issue is the fact that there's two different ways, and you have to find them. Like for a while, and it's like I didn't click triangles because like oh, that's probably like a way to view what it looks like, instead of actually thinking oh, that gives me more in-depth status information on weapons and armor. Like how is I supposed to know that off the top of my head? Also, sticking to the team of item shops, we have. The ability to fuse items together. Now this means like say if you have two weapons of the same name you can fuse them together into one weapon. What this does is increase the base status strength so if it gives attack and focus fusing them together increases the overall attack and focus stats. But what it also does is work with the secondary stats. So each weapon while they have the same name and same base stats they offer different secondary stats such as if you dodge you have a 10% chance of getting your battle gauge to go up one level or strength against ground monsters or dragon monsters and if you fuse them you have a chance of them basically combining into one weapon. I'm gonna go away from the item shop now because I think that's not to say about that. So back to exploring the world and exploration in Tales of Zestiria is a very rich and rewarding experience as this walking around you're going to find treasure chests, stunning sceneries and these ancient pillars which offer you, I believe they call them AP which increase your battle actions and I will explain battle actions in a few minutes. Now to make this to make this exploration much more I suppose in a way easier there is the support talent system for your companions and this mean this support talent system basically means your character gives an extra help for when you're out in the in the world exploring so you would have maybe Edna might give you money every few steps you take it's like oh here's some money for you Lila will do healing maintenance where say if your party are injured after a fight and they're low in health just walk around and Lila will heal you then there's also ones like they will make items for you they will point out chests point out points of interest they will help you find pillars four talents like that basically but it's limited to one each which Kind of you have to kind of min max in a way because it's fascinating because some actually overlap together so Mikleo has one type of item item creation and I think Lila has one as one of her own as well so it's all about choice also with the companions on the exploration world they have out of combat elemental abilities abilities that allow you to progress through the story and allow you to access areas you couldn't normally access so for example wind elemental gives you the ability to jump gaps the earth elemental allows you to destroy boulders, fire allows you to light objects on fire, and water allows you to become invisible. Now finally I want to get back to the battle actions I mentioned earlier. These are basically like permanent, passive and active buffs for combat. 
basically as you level through the game you are given acts you are given these battle actions and to be able to use them you need to have enough action points and these action points are gained by finding ancient pillars leveling up and completing story missions and some side missions throughout the game so basically everything you do in the game helps you collect ap for these battle actions so what are these battle actions well they're stuff like auto guard where the game will automatically guard you against attacks five times so say if you get to press the square button to do a guard the game will automatically do it for you up to five times then you have aerial recovery which helps you recover from being knocked in the air better and there's also a peeling guard which helps you draw aggro off your companion which is very handy in boss battles because companions die relatively easy in them so it's very handy in that regard so as we finish talking about the gameplay i'm going to go into talking about the graphics music and audio in the game so what's the graphics music and audio like in tales of hysteria this is probably the part of the review that i'm probably the least informed in because my knowledge of graphics music and audio is pretty limited so what I say about the graphics is, it is gorgeous, it looks gorgeous as PlayStation 4. The vistas in the distance look absolutely stunning, they actually look like paintings at some regards, which is brilliant. I like the fact of how the characters work against the background. The backgrounds are very rich in colour, very almost cartoonishy like, but the characters are very well drawn against the background drawing this background they stand out so you know it's not just a set piece they're actually modeled well, the model well against the background so that's very nicely done you can easily tell the difference between a model and the environment i suppose that's probably the best way to say it however there are some very noticeable graphical problems monsters in the distance they have moved in an almost robotic manner but when you get up close they begin to look more smoother I think that's a way for developers to make the huge draw distance. This huge draw distance also caused the problem with textures. I remember when I was approaching a castle from a large distance, the textures kept updating from low, medium, the maximum it was, incrementally as I was approaching, and you could see it very obviously as like there's this circle was permeating out from different locations basically smooth out the texture and the whole graphics as a whole of the object which was very off-putting. Now for music, now I'm not a huge music buff but the music in Tales of Sisteria was amazing and well was and is amazing I suppose is the best way to say. The music in Tales of Sisteria really matches how, what the gameplay and the story it helps create the powerful emotions that are going on screen I find but out some of the music that's been playing a lot of the emotional moments in the story wouldn't have the weight that it did when you have sad moments you have slow somber melodies that enact feelings of loss and reflection but the music also feels lively when you're doing the shepherd trials each trial location has this very fast upbeat music that makes you like yes i want to get through this trial and i want to get the power it's very invigorating it sometimes Although the music has a problem, just like the graphics, where the music likes to sometimes overlap cutscenes. So you want to hear this important cutscene, but you have music playing way too loud. Now, I try to fix that myself by going through the options menu and changing the levels of audio, but it didn't make a difference. So I don't know why that's there for. Lastly, since we, I just mentioned it, audio. The English voice acting in Tales of Hysteria is, in my opinion, perfect. Each actor delivers his or her lines with the right level of sincerity, so Edna sounds exactly an axe in her voice capacity how I expect her to act in real life. Now, I know a lot of people who play JRPGs detest the idea of having English voice actors. I, I honestly don't know the reasoning behind that but i'll leave that alone so for you people who do not like having the english english voice actors in your jrpgs there is the option to have japanese audio with english subtitles now with finish talk with the graphics music and audio let's give my conclusion on the game so yes my review of tales of zisteria is now coming to the end as i present my conclusions on the game but before i give my conclusion i want to point something out i didn't know where best to say this in the review but if you're playing the ps4 and you like using the share functionality for screenshots 
recording videos or streaming from the PlayStation console, you cannot do that. Are, these are all disabled by Bandai Namco Entertainment. I can see kind of why they would do it, especially like they don't want spoilers getting out, but it's a very weird idea and for it's so just a little kind of PSA, I suppose, really in a way. If you're looking to do these in the game, sorry, you can't. So what is my conclusion on Tales of Sisteria? Tales of Sisteria is a game filled with fantastic characters and a beautiful world but is let down by a story that just takes too long to get going and a combat system which is initially fun becomes a bit of a chore. So with that in mind, my score for Tales of Sisteria is 7.5 out of 10 with its pros being a fantastic cast of characters, beautiful world and lots to find and see within that world. My negatives regarding the game are the fact that the story takes far too long to get going and has a very limited number of side quests. Now in between those pros and negatives there is the fact that the combat jumps between engaging and button mashing. Thank you for listening and watching this review of Tales of Hysteria. If you like this new format please let me know in the comment section and as overall please like, favour and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching, this has been Aaron Mean from SG Gaming Info, saying goodbye. He changed characters to try to defend from the AI, but with the new interception intelligence, I see my 